Thanks, Lee. OK, so what we're going to cover, I'm going to start a little bit, start with a little bit about myself and my motivation uh, for teaching GraphQL. And then I'll go into how we developed a workshop that successfully teaches GraphQL through what we're calling motivated narratives. And then at the end, I'll give you some resources you can use when you're teaching GraphQL or introducing it to your colleagues. So first, a bit about my background so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, so I worked on a product team as a user of GraphQL when I was at Facebook. And I really enjoyed using GraphQL and decided you know, I wanted to work on GraphQL full time. So I was lucky enough to move to the Relay team. And while I was on Relay, I worked on this great project called Deferrable Requests, which kind of lets you break up a GraphQL response into smaller chunks. So here you have an example. Uh, you have these like easy part of the query, this fast for sale fields, and then we have this really expensive part of the query. And we want that part of the query to execute a little bit later and come after the first fast part of the query comes. It's a really interesting problem that it only exists because of how much better GraphQL is than the alternative. So if you had a REST API, you would just uh, get the ID and make another query, which is what you end up doing in GraphQL for these cases, but we can make it much nicer. So it's something that would make a really good talk on its own, but I think uh, this talk about teaching GraphQL is more important because people will need to understand GraphQL if it's really going to take off. So more relevant for this talk, I was one of the people that taught the GraphQL class at Facebook that every new engineer Facebook attends in their first couple of weeks. Uh, and as an aside, I, so the first time I gave the class, I was curious like how long the students had been at Facebook before they started the class. So of course, at Facebook, you can query everything through GraphQL. So I opened up Graphical, wrote a query, and you know, found out it was about two weeks. I thought, that's a great demonstration of GraphQL. So now when I'm demonstrating Graphical to the class, I write the same query live in front of everybody. And it's really not until they see that demo that their eyes start to light up. And they really, you can tell the ideas start to click. And that's the point where they really get excited. OK, so we don't really have a lot of time uh, when we're teaching the class. It's only a short, hour-long intro that goes over GraphQL at a high level and gives uh, the engineers some history on GraphQL's development. But it's really important uh, the newcomers to Facebook get this kind of cultural indoctrina indoctrination because it's what allows Facebook to ship new experiences so quickly. You know, for example, Marketplace. So Marketplace is the perfect example of how using the right technologies can allow a team to execute quickly. So it's a pretty new part of the Facebook app, and it le leverages GraphQL, React Native, and Relay to go from idea to produ production insanely fast. So it's just, it's insanely fast, especially for a mobile app where you traditionally have these like two week dev cycles. And the growth of this thing is really incredible. It's used, there was a post uh, uh, a React Na about React Native this morning. It's used by 800 million people every month. Um, and it's partially thanks to GraphQL that they were able to scale and move so quickly. So obviously, there's something special about GraphQL. And I found it so special that I started a company centered around GraphQL. That company is OneGraph. So OneGraph is a single GraphQL endpoint that wraps all the internet's APIs. So having a GraphQL interface for every API that you can hit from the browser, it's great all by itself. But since this is GraphQL, we can also make the links between those APIs explicit. So it's not something that's easy to tell. It's kind of something you have to show. So I'll just do a quick demo. OK. So here we are. Imagine you are a developer. You want to talk to, uh, you want to get data about like a YouTube video inside of your application. So we're going to get a YouTube video by its ID. And we're going to pull out the title. And then we can pull out like the channel ID. And this is where like a REST API would end. You would go hit another endpoint, get the information about the channel. But of course, we're in GraphQL. So we can look at the upload channel. That's what we actually want and get its title. And there's this really cool thing you can do on YouTube uh, for your channel, you can associate uh, other social media services like Instagram or Facebook 
Um, so in this case, we're just going to get all of the Twitter accounts associated with uh, that channel. And we're going to get the first five tweets from each of those accounts and just get the text. So now we're in the Twitter part of the graph. And a tweet has this thing called entities. So we'll look at all of the user mentions on the tweet. And we'll pull out the screen name. And for each of those users, let's jump in and look at their timeline and get their first five tweets. <laughs> and we'll get the text from each of those tweets. So now we've, we've been in YouTube. Uh, we went to the channel. We, got, we jumped over to Twitter. We got the first five tweets from the Twitter accounts. We got the first five tweets from the people that they tweeted about. Let's jump back, go full circle, and we'll go all the way back to YouTube <laughs> and get the title for every video. And that's going to go out, make you know, 50, 100 requests, come back into a single result. Oh, All right, go back to the talk. Aha, yeah. uh -huh. thank you. OK, so why is the, graph, the one graph thing relevant to this talk? Well, if you're going to build GraphQL for everything, you, know, you also have to get everybody to use GraphQL. So everybody has to love GraphQL in order for this to be successful. But these two things have to happen simultaneously, and they, they kind of feed off of each other. So GraphQL APIs have to exist before people can get excited about them, and people have to be excited about them before you know, there's the, really the demand to build them. So that kind of explains part of my motivation for wanting to really teach people how to use GraphQL. So what does someone who wants to see GraphQL succeed do? Well, the obvious answer for us was to start teaching GraphQL workshops. So you see, we set up an Eventbrite event. Uh, it's called Learn to Build Real World Apps with GraphQL. There's a picture of my co-founder, Sean Grove. Uh, he's got the results of a GraphQL query in the background. I think that's the Gmail API. Um, so we developed a curriculum inspired by Facebook's class, but we went in much more depth. So Facebook only gives us an hour to teach GraphQL. And you know the workshop we wanted to be like two or three. So let's talk about how we developed this class. So this kind of gets into our pedagogical philosophy. Um, and we developed some principles. And using these principles, you know, we created a workshop that works well and ends with students who can go out and use GraphQL. And more importantly, they can teach others about GraphQL. So they can go into their companies, convince their coworkers that GraphQL is worth checking out. So let's look at some of the principles. So the main five are build concepts on top of one another. And we'll get into more detail on that. Teach new concepts with motivated narratives. That doing is understanding. Uh, that you should make your students independent, and you should entice their imagination with impressive demos. So before we dive into the principles, let's start with a quick anecdote. So I have a friend who's very into OCaml. He do, uses OCaml at his job. Uh, and he knew I was working on a startup, and he was asking me, oh, tell me about this GraphQL startup. So I asked him, well, what have you heard about GraphQL? What do you know? And he had told me, oh, I have a coworker, one of the front-end developers, they love GraphQL because they can uh, request from the server just the fields they need, and it saves them data, which is great. That's like a pretty core feature of GraphQL. But this is someone who loves types. He loves type system. And he had no idea that there was even a type system behind it. And so what we want to do is make it so that even the front-end engineer, who has never used types, understands the benefits of the type system and can explain it to people. And so this person who is very excited about OCaml, maybe he would have been excited about GraphQL, and we could have had two GraphQL OCaml servers and just, instead of just one. So GraphQL, it's easy to learn, but you know, we want something a little bit deeper. It still needs to be taught. If you want people to have a clear understanding of graph, how GraphQL works, you want them to explain it to others, you have to go a little deeper. OK, so let's get into the principles. Uh, so these are the principles we use to develop the class. The first is that we should 
build concepts on top of each other. So later knowledge builds on earlier knowledge. So let's take a, an example from algebra. So here we have a relatively simple equation for a curve, but you have no hope of solving this equation if you don't know what an exponent is or an operator is. So this is uh, straight from the Wikipedia page. You can see at the bottom it has at least six concepts that you have to know, and you have to be able to use them and integrate them before you even know what an equation means. You have to be able to use them all independently. So GraphQL is similar. So we'll take a look at like a relatively simple equation that you might, or a simple query that you might see in any application. It's not too bad. But then when you start breaking it down, there's a ton of new concepts here. So you have non-nullable types, you have fragment spreads, you have to know how to define fragment spreads and that they live on a type. Uh, we have variables, uh, special syntax for aliases. So there's a lot going on here. And each of these concepts has to be introduced and motivated separately, or else you know, the person is going to be completely lost. They're going to lose interest. So we introduce concepts slowly when we teach the class. You know, the first query they see is the one on the left. It just has one or two concepts. And then we move on to this query that you probably can't read, but there's a lot in it, and it covers almost every feature of GraphQL. So this brings us to the next principle we use to develop the uh, workshop, which is teach new concepts with motivated narratives. So this is where the history of GraphQL and its core principles about how it was designed come into play. So for example, like why do fragments exist if they don't know that GraphQL was designed around the way product developers think and designed to be composable? Then they won't understand this. Or like why is the tooling around GraphQL so amazing? If they don't really understand about introspection and the type system, they won't really understand uh, what's, what's behind it. So we're going to go into an example straight from the slides uh, used to teach the uh, Facebook class. So we're going to use motivated narratives to teach how to motivate new concepts with narratives, kind of taking a lesson from the class principles. So these are slides straight from the deck used by the GraphQL class to teach GraphQL. So you want to teach people a core principle, which is composition. So we put up a, a profile page, and we say, OK, here's our view. Like, How are we structure the data? Of course, first you break it into its components. So these are two views inside this larger timeline view. You have a header view and an about view. And so now that we have this view hierarchy, how do we structure our data? And so in the class, we just go, we show them this uh, fragments. You know, you can put your header fields in the header fragment and your uh, about fields in the about fragment. And then you combine them. Uh, and the timeline query has no idea what's in the header fragment uh, or in the about fragment. And that's good. That, that tells people how it works. But we can motivate the concept much more if we show them the alternative. So let's try that again. We're going to implement this same GraphQL query in a naive way where we don't know about fragments. We don't know about this great feature. So we're going to write a query. These are all concepts that the students have seen before. right? You've nothing new in here. Um, they haven't been introduced to fragments yet. And here we have all the data for the view. Right? Alice added name for header. Bob added current work and school for the about. Maybe Alice decides to add a cover photo for the header. And then Bob decides, you know, school shouldn't go in about view, so he removes school. And then, oh no, Alice was relying on school. She used it. Now it's missing. Everything broke. So now the student, he sees a familiar problem. We don't have any separation of concerns. We have this one big query that describes all the data, and it doesn't match how we think about the views at all. So let's try again and see what GraphQL provides to solve this problem. So then we go in, and that's when we introduce fragments. And then here we teach, teach you that GraphQL lets you group your fields into composable packages, just like components in React, and then back to the same slide before. And then we go through the same explanation. So now, once people see these extra slides and they see the motivation for this feature, then they really understand it. And I could actually see the difference in their faces when I explained it with these two approaches. There are a couple of other things that we also added extra motivation to, like aliases and uh, having queries inside of mutations. Um, but it's not just a subjective, like, they look happy. We also have an objective measure. So the students in the Facebook class, they give it a rating of 1 to 5 at the end of the session. And those are my ratings at the blue. So I was like threes and fours. And then here are some of the other instructors 
in the green, mostly fours and fives. So to be fair, I was competing with titans like Lee Byron and Adam Kramer in this class. But after I started adding more motivation to the concepts, uh, I started to move into the same league as these two. So you can see my numbers jumped up. For a brief period, I had all fives. I was the top one. And the next morning, I got a couple of fours. All right, let's go to the next principle. Uh, so doing is understanding. So you can explain things to people, but they have to do them on their own before the ideas really stick. So for each new concept we introduce in the workshop, first I explain what we're doing and why. I show them how it works. Then we write some code together. And then I give them a task to do on their own. And then it's when they're writing the code on their own that the ideas really stick. And this takes time, but it really cements it in their mind. Of course, it's important to practice what you preach. preach. So I've tried to use the same principles that I listed for my class, my talk today. But of course, we don't have any code to write. So if you want to apply the principles of this talk, I'm putting all the workshop materials on GitHub. And I encourage everyone here to use these as resources to teach other people about GraphQL. So this would be you doing to understand. So another important principle is to make your students independent. So it's important that the students are able to figure out things for themselves after you're gone. So the first thing we do, as soon as I show them that first query, that hello world viewer name query, they're running that query in Graphical. And they're actually learning how to explore new GraphQL concepts on their own. So lastly, it's important to teach the principles of GraphQL. So GraphQL has its own principles. These are principles I came up with, and you can argue a bit about which are important enough to belong and which ones I left out. But we'll go over them quickly. So the first is that GraphQL is a mental model for developers. So that explains why the query looks like JSON, why fragments exist, why the server is supposed to serve the needs of the client. But it also affects how you build your GraphQL, how you build your server. It would encourage you like, not to build out functionality that the client won't need. You're not going to expose arbitrary filters on a connection that the server can't efficiently run. And another is that it has an introspectable type system. And this explains why the tooling is so great. And this explains why your code can be concise and you don't have to have null checks everywhere. And the next is composition, which we went over in some detail with that example. And then that it's backed by arbitrary code. Now, we don't get into that in our front end workshop because it doesn't really come up. But we're also thinking about a server workshop where this is very important because people don't really understand where GraphQL fits. And then the last is mutations. OK, so the takeaways of the talk are build concepts on top of each other. You want to make sure you, ex you show things one piece at a time. The other is teach new concepts with motivated narratives. You want to say, like, what is the alternative? Why does this exist? What would go wrong if it didn't exist? The other is doing is understanding. Uh, you have to make sure the students actually write their own code so they really understand it and really take it home with them. And the last is make your students independent. You know, show them the tooling. Uh, make them able to learn things on their own. And the last is inspire their imagination with impressive demos. So this is something I tried to do with that demo of one graph. You know, I kind of showed you what it was doing and the effort it saved. And you can imagine the pain you'd go through if you tried to create that same result without GraphQL. Um, and that's, that's what gets people over the hump. That's, that's what gets them excited. And that, that's what pushes them to keep learning, even though it's, it's tough and they're stuck. OK, so that's my talk. I have a link to the workshop materials there. I hope you'll go out and teach people GraphQL.